the organization was based in a little town called Quigney, East London. Um, and the work that they did was HIV AIDS awareness and prevention. Doing that work ignited something in me that sort of directed my path professionally. At that time, I had determined that I want to spend, that I wanted to spend the rest of my life uh, professionally working in the space to improve the lives of others. And so when I got back to the States, that's the course that I set out to do, uh, I set out on. And so I began my career in nonprofit uh, management and NGO engagement. Um, so I work for some of the largest nonprofits on the globe. Uh, as I mentioned, American Red Cross, I spent time there. I spent time also with the American Cancer Society. I work for Boys and Girls Club of America. And then I've also spent time working with small family foundations. Um, and so in all of that work, um, it all sort of points to this um, passion of mine to help make people's lives better, um, even if I never get to meet these people um, ever, uh, as long as I live. I want to make sure that people have access to resources, that people are able to improve their qualities of lives, um, that they are able to do so with uh, dignity, with hope, and with enthusiasm. Um, and yeah, and so that sort of um, has been my journey. Now, your decision to go to South Africa to study the, the women, the situation of the women there, does it have to do with your study of, Af to your African study, uh, which is where you major in the university? Absolutely. I spent four years at Tulane University completely immersed in um, the academia side of uh, the diaspora. And as a woman, um, you know, there have always been challenges uh, for us. We've always had to address, you know, disparities uh, in regards to our voice and um, um, our importance and our relevance in any and every space. Um, but in the diaspora and across the diaspora, that was even much, you know, was even more significant. Um, and so, yeah, so my studies absolutely uh, led, led me to this intent desire to address and to, you know, raise awareness about uh, the uh, marginalization of women, uh, particularly in sports, as well as, um, um, you know, beyond the, um, the system of apartheid. Uh, well, the question of Afpata, maybe we might not really need to open that argument uh, today because, uh, yeah, you have both legs and hands and all of it uh, because um, this is a system that existed when the world was already civilized. If we want to put it like that, no? Okay. That we see a very uh, few minority of people who come and they prison the entire, entire population. Uh, they were armed. They have every resources to be able to do that. Uh, we have this big giant country like the United States um, and not doing anything about it because they didn't see to, to feel concerned about it, no? Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of things happened there uh, during the time. So it appeared as if the violence, the oppression was actually sanctioned by Western government because they could have done something mm -hmm. if they wanted to, but they choose not to. They joined the part of the oppression and the people just mm -hmm. suffered. They died, a lot of people died. And that was really very horrible a situation in Africa. That could Absolutely. have been avoided by the bigger power, but they choose not to. That Absolutely. is not a good thing. Yeah. Well, the, well, the interesting thing about that, and you know, we see those types of choices being made even today, right? And it all goes back to what is the value proposition of the people involved? What is what are the value propositions for those who could actually make change? And if that value proposition does not rise to the need of what these larger um, first world countries um, believe are valuable, then they won't engage. They won't step in. They won't um, uh, try to um, alleviate the pain and suffering of people um, from around the globe because there isn't a direct um, uh, interest, right? But then you have agencies like the UN Foundation who try to raise awareness about these issues and try to you know, make larger uh, countries 
um, and, and first world countries sort of understand what the needs are and how everything is really all interconnected. Sometimes those issues um, receive attention and resources and a lot of times, unfortunately, they don't. A lot of people died there. A lot of people died. A lot of people were mutilated, massacred. What really was needed for the United Nations to take action? What really was needed for bigger players like the United States to take action to say, we stand for justice? Anyway, again, justice, um, <laughs> like I often say in this podcast, we can never expect the West to give justice in, in terms of Africa. It's not going to happen. Like Dr. Ben we said, they will give you just this. So we're not going to get justice from there. So that okay. And that is that is what it is. All right, that that is fine. We're not going to make some blame today. That that's that is okay. Now, uh, you did African studies. Uh you have never been to Africa. You have been in US. In your preparation to go to Africa, what was your impression? What was your understanding? What did you think you were going to find in Africa? So what I knew was that South Africa was a incredibly developed nation, right? Uh, Perception-wise in the United States, you know, people have to understand that images of the continent were always presented in a particular way, as if the continent, number one, was one country, uh, two, that there was no industrialization, and three, that the people who lived on the continent um, were not as um, technologically savvy or academically savvy. Um, and I knew that all of those um, stereotypes were wrong, right? And when I got to South Africa, I was it, it was confirmed, right? So there are parts of the country um, that are rural, right? But that rings true for the United States. There are parts of the country that are incredibly industrialized, right? And when I stepped foot in Johannesburg, I felt like I was in New York City. When I visited uh, Cape Town, I felt like I was in San Francisco. When I spent time in Durban, I felt like I was in Atlanta. Uh, when I spent time, I lived actually in Quigney, East London, and that town reminded me of, the, of, of Alabama during the height of the civil rights movement. And so there were all of these um, similarities that endeared me to South Africa, right, that reminded me of home. And then there were experiences that I felt and that I witnessed that reminded me of what it must have been like growing up during the Jim Crow era in the United States, right? When we're talking about the levels of um, racial injustices, um, the uh, amount of discrimination and segregation that was almost parallel, if not exactly parallel to what it was like being in, uh, in, in the South during the Jim Crow era and the eras of uh, segregation. Um, that's what it was like when I was there in South Africa in 1998, 1999. 